I'm Katie Parla, and today we're gonna make polo la cacciadora, or chicken cacciatore, as we say in my parts, AKA New Jersey. But I live in Rome now, and so we're gonna do it Roman style. So if you grew up with an Italian-American version, you're probably saying, Katie Parla, where are the tomatoes? Where are the peas? Where are the carrots? Where are the mushrooms? Or any of the other zillion things that end up in polo alla cacciadora when it's made abroad. We're just focused on the central and southern Italian components. So, chicken, in this case, only dark meat. I'm not even thinking about chicken breasts right now. Don't like them, so just legs and thighs. Um, some herbs. I'm going for some sage and some rosemary that grow out on the terrace. Uh, garlic. Some olive oil. You know my preferences. Uh, this is Gaudenzi's uh, Quinta Luna. Super delicious, very aromatic. Uh, I'm only gonna recommend that you cook with wine that you would actually drink, and in this case, uh, a white wine from near Luca, and then I'll finish it off with a little bit of vinegar. So we're gonna get this like super tangy, but balanced acidity with the fat components. You can see just how yellow the skin is, or the fat from the skin is gonna render into the pan, and that's gonna really like make the aromatics pop. And it's just gonna be such a delicious stew. You're gonna wanna eat it with your hands with reckless abandon. So let's get started. Chicken cacciatore is one of my top bites in town. I usually eat it in the sort of pizza pita at Trapizzino. And so this particular recipe is inspired by that fast food concept invented in Testaccio in 2009. There's also one just down the hill in Trastevere that I stop by one to two times a day <laughs> with food tours. Not to eat only two Trapizzini a day. I mean, I like them, but that's crazy. So this is chicken that I salted overnight. If you don't have time or if you didn't remember, you can also salt an hour in advance um, if possible. Like it'll just give you a more flavorful final product. Now, this was in the fridge. I took it out an hour and a half ago because I wanted to come up to room temperature. It's just gonna cook more evenly if I'm cooking like a room temperature chicken instead of a cold one. But first I've got my garlic and I just wanna infuse this delicious Umbrian oil, Queen de Luna from Gaudenzi. So as we know, I do not measure anything. That's a little more than enough uh, because the chicken is gonna be cooked skin side down, which is gonna render the fat and bring a sort of unctuousness to the pan anyway. So when I'm starting with the cold pan and then I just want to cook the garlic until it softens a little bit and takes on a little bit of color. I don't wanna burn it. I'm gonna keep an eye on it. I mean, honestly, nine times out of 10 when I'm cooking garlic, I walk away and it burns and then everything smells crazy and tastes bitter, but for the camera, <laughs> we'll be paying attention. It's important to know the idiosyncrasies of your stovetop. When I'm cooking on what is low, according to the stove, it's actually closer to like medium in another cooking scenario. So the more you cook, the more you get to know like the hot spots of your oven, the hot spots of your pans, and what the sort of more actual temperature of your stovetop is. So once this takes on a little bit of color, um, I'm going to add the chicken. Just gonna take a while. If your oil temperature gets really out of control, the fastest way to cool it down is to add more oil. Room temperature oil will bring down the average temperature of the oil in the pan and save you from burning your oil. So I can already see some of the garlic is turning a little bit translucent on one side. Yeah, I'm just turning it. And you know, it's, it's a combination of color and texture that I'm looking for. I want this to just barely start to turn a little bit golden colored. There are a few garlic schools of thought in Italy. Um, some cooks would cut off the tough end, then have the garlic lengthwise and take out that sort of greenish stem in the middle. That's called togliendo l'anima or taking out the soul. Sounds intense. Uh, it's one extra step. Sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't. Yvonne, what do you think? Take out the sole or no? Okay, I'm not doing it today, sorry. All right, so I'm hearing sizzling. That's too hot. Too hot, so I'm flipping it over. This is the consistency that I'm looking for. Kind of ruffled texture, kind of crinkly. This is as low as it goes and it's still too hot. So this is how you can cool it off. Add a little more oil there and it stopped boiling. So after around five minutes, it's time to add the chicken. 
I'm gonna add the chicken skin side down. I'm gonna continue to salt throughout the process just to build some flavor, but I'm not gonna be too aggressive because I want to adjust for seasoning at the very end. If I'm like adding too much salt throughout the process, the final product is gonna be too salty. Don't want that. Also, I'm using chicken stock. Normally I use like water or vegetable stock that's unsalted. Today I just happen to have salted chicken stock. So the salt is gonna concentrate. Don't wanna to go too heavy. Otherwise it'll be too salty in the end. So this is the garlic that's just started to take color. Chicken's ready to go in. Ooh! As you may know, salting meat draws some moisture out of it. I'm out of paper towels, so I didn't pat the chicken dry, hence the light splatter. So just be aware of that. And I'm like kind of overcrowding this. It's gonna be okay. But I know from experience that, you know, this part of the pan doesn't heat as evenly as this part. So during the cooking process, I'll be moving the chicken around. This is the point where, when I can get rid of the garlic. It's done its trick. It's lent its flavor to the oil. Plus I wanna turn up the heat and I would burn the garlic if I did that with it still in the oil. So I'm just letting this kind of chill for a minute. I can already see the fat from the chicken skin is starting to join the olive oil in the pan. Ooh, it's popping. So once the fat has rendered a bit and I've turned the chicken to kind of like start cooking on the other side and in saporita or to take on the flavors of the garlic infused oil, I'm gonna add some herbs and then I'm gonna add some wine. The wine, well, you can't really see it. It's in this, it's a macerated wine from near Luca. So it's a little bit on the, I don't know, Auburn side. But this is wine that I would pour into a glass and drink. At an Italian supermarket, you would find a lot of uh, Tavernello or similar, like the little box wine that are perfect for, like when you need to add a cup or a half a cup of wine to a dish that you're braising. That is not wine of quality, and so I would never use it. But, well, that's not true, I have used it. I wouldn't recommend using it because it's also fun when you're cooking this meat to pour a glass of wine while you wait as it cooks. Because once all the steps I mentioned are done, it's gonna have to cook for another hour. So open a good bottle of wine. I recommend white, or in this case, an orange wine, and then sip it as the chicken cooks. See, this didn't cook nearly as evenly because it's at that edge that doesn't get warm in this pan. But there is more fat in here because the olive oil has been joined by the rendered fat from the skin of the chicken. Too hot. Would I recommend doing this with skinless chicken? No. Look, you can even use chicken breast. I personally don't because I prefer dark meat. I also like the experience of the bone in chicken. If you're using a mix of dark meat and breast meat, manage in the following way. Take the chicken breast out uh, at least 20 minutes earlier than uh, the rest of the chicken. So set it aside and then let the dark meat finish cooking, reintroduce the breast meat, and then add the vinegar and let it cook a little bit more so all the flavors marry. That way you're not overcooking the breast. So you have like super tender flavorful thighs and then sawdust texture breast. That's not good, not delicious. Where's our piggy? There she is, oops. Okay, I'm always regulating the heat, trying to keep everything from splattering while attempting to evenly cook. And I'm not cooking it all the way through right now. I'm just rendering a little bit of that fat. Now I can add rosemary. Oops. This is just a one big rosemary sprig from the garden. This is just some sage. Oops. And I want that to like really get soaked in the oil so it imparts all of its flavors. And I'm just gonna leave it in. I'll later pick out the rosemary or maybe I'll leave it in when I serve it. I don't know, I haven't decided yet. You don't wanna eat the rosemary sprig. So if you're being fancy, you could take it out later or just serve it and tell people not to eat it. All right, so I'm cooking the herbs until they're fragrant. Like I can smell their essential oils wafting off of the pan. I'd say we're ready for the vino. This is about half, three quarters of a cup of wine. I just wanna cook this until the alcohol aroma dissipates a bit. 
and the liquid has uh, reduced a little bit. This side is boiling. I don't really want, I don't want to boil. I want it to be at medium high. Okay, so the liquid is thickening a little bit. This guy looks like he's not cooking so evenly. You know what? Executive decision. He's going in the middle. Okay, once we have some reduction going on of the liquid, I'm actually going to add more liquid, different liquid, some chicken stock. Most cooks that I know who make this recipe will just add some water. You can do that too. What you don't want to do is totally submerge the chicken. As it cooks, you want to keep the level maybe like half of the way up the height of the chicken and gently simmer it low and slow. And then, you know, move the chicken around occasionally to make sure it's being evenly cooked. And that's going to tenderize the flesh, keep everything really moist and delicious. So this is a little bit of chicken stock and I have raised the heat. I want to submerge the chicken maximum halfway. Now I'm just turning it down and I want to keep it barely simmering. This is the lowest it's going to go. If I had a cover, I would cover this, but not the entire cooking time because then it's going to be too wet in the pan. I would maybe cook it for like half an hour covered and then take the lid off. Um, and then some of the liquid would evaporate, concentrate, and that's going to make the suget or that like very juicy sauce that's going to be served with the chicken. I'm going to let that rock for 30 minutes. And then I'm going to come back and check on it, move the chicken around, make sure everything's doing well, adding more liquid as needed to keep half of the chicken submerged. So the chicken has been cooking for about an hour. Periodically, I would come in and add a little bit more of the chicken stock just to make sure that the pan was still nice and juicy, not drying out. I tasted the sauce. It's got a good salty component to it, so I'm not going to salt it more. Remember, the stock had salt in it, so keep that in mind if you're using salted stock. If you're not, you're going to have to use a little bit more seasoning. And then the last step, it's kind of last 10 minutes when everything marries and the flavors all sort of unify, I add some white wine vinegar, which is going to give a really nice uh, not too bracing, but like present acidity when the dish is done. Oh, it smells so good. This is a pretty good quality white wine vinegar. You could use apple cider vinegar. I wouldn't use anything that's too sharp. And I turned up the heat just to reduce the liquid a little bit more because now that I'm done braising, now that the chicken I can see is detaching from the bone, I just want to concentrate the liquid so that I'm going to have a thick sugetto to like drizzle over. And guys, I can't tell you how hungry I am right now. I've been thinking about chicken cacciatore all day. I went twice to Trapizzino today with clients that I took there on a food tour. Uh, both groups got chicken cacciatore trapizzini. So like I had to cook this tonight. Obviously I salted it last night, so I knew this was happening. I always salt my chicken in advance. That way the salt has time to penetrate the meat, really give it great flavor. And that is gonna pay dividends when I braise this chicken in the style of the hunter tomorrow. So just hitting it with some fine sea salt. I'll wrap this, put it in the fridge and see it tomorrow. Can I tell you, this is one of the simplest recipes that you'll make. It's super satisfying and it actually tastes better the next day. So you can make way more than this if you've got a big pan and then put some in the fridge, eat some night of and have delicious chicken cacciatore double header. I am just going to turn this off. The juices have concentrated. Oh, so dense and delicious. I got out a fork and knife, even though I'm definitely using my hands. So who am I kidding? You can see just how, thick and dense the sauces. Oh my God. Ooh, it's on the move. Let's see, I've got this guy here. The sauce is a mixture of like concentrated fat, vinegar, perfumed with herbs and garlic. In the end, a lot of the rosemary leaves detached, but if I was serving this, I would get rid of this guy. Bye. But this is, oh my God, it looks so good. It smells so like tangy, vinegary. This is the part of the show where I burn my mouth. Oh my freaking God. That's so good. Holy shit. I don't want to eat this in front of you. I want to eat this in private. This is the bomb. Polo de cacciadora.
inspired by Trapizzino. Of course, there they take everything off the bone, stuff it into a pizza pita. I'm happy with it this way. I'm gonna find some bread somewhere because I need to do a scarpetta and soak up all this juice. I loved it. So you can find the recipe below or on my website. Don't forget to subscribe to notifications, like, share, all that good stuff. See you next time. Ciao.